And uh, I'm, I see that we have some, some new young people visiting with us this morning. And uh, let's give them a hand clap of praise for being here. It's good to have you with us this morning. And, and please just come back and visit with us when you can. We're just glad to have you. We're glad to have each of you this morning. If you are new to the church or if you're visiting this morning, been here a few times or this is your first time, we want to welcome you. And we just invite each of you to come back and be with us. And um, I just look forward to worshiping this morning. Are you, are you feeling what I'm feeling? Grateful for, for what God's doing in this church, the growth that we are experiencing, the way that He's touching us through our, our, uh, our worship service and, and the message that's, uh, that's coming forth. And we just look so forward to hearing from Him this morning. And I know that He has something very, very special in store for us. So, if you're able, stand with us. <clears throat> we want to go to him this morning. And just praise him for who he is and um, ask that he would have his way yet again today. And uh, if you have a need that uh, you know that only God can answer, just raise your hands this morning. Just present that to him. As always, you see somebody standing, standing in front of you, beside you with their hand up. Just pray for them this morning. You don't have to know their need. Just, just know that they have a need. God knows, knows everything about us, but I know that you'll be blessed for praying for their need this morning. I just really feel that in my heart. So if you would do that this morning. Let's just bow our heads and as I say, let's just, let's just stand before Him this morning. Let's just present ourselves for worship and praise Him for who He is. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we do thank You for who You are this morning. Father, You are our everything. You're the Creator of all that exists. Father, You have the power to answer our every prayer, the needs that we have. Father, that there is nothing too hard for You. There's nothing that You cannot do this morning. And we thank You for the opportunity that You have given us to be here. Father, the freedom that You give us just to worship You the way that we desire, the way that You put it in our heart. To worship you. We thank you for that. Father we praise you for who you are. God we just ask that you would have your way. As we present ourselves for worship. Father we ask that you would forgive us for those things. Father that we've done against you. This is a brand new day. We can forget about tomorrow. We have to stand on what we do today. So, Father we ask that you would refresh this relationship that we have. Father, that You would indeed receive our worship, God, in the Spirit in which we offer it, and that it would be good to You. But we do ask for forgiveness. May we be specific this morning. Take the time and be specific in what we ask of You this morning to forgive us for, for the things that we know that we've done against You, for the things that we don't realize that we have done against You. Just forgive us this morning. Father, just let us stand before You fresh and, and new this morning, ready to receive what You have for us. Father, for those hands that were lifted, God, You know the needs this morning. Father, You know the needs for healing. God, You know the, the needs for finance this morning. Father, for relationships that need to be rebuilt. Father, for our emotional struggles, for our spiritual issues. Father, only You, only You can touch us this morning that, that You can bring forth change, that, that You can break chains that bind us. Father, that You can make everything alright. We're asking that this morning. Father, that You would take the burdens that we have. Father, that You would take the brokenness that we have. Father, that You would strengthen us, that You would make us whole again. Only You, only You can do these things for us this morning. Father, we just ask that You would once again fill this place with Your Spirit. We're so thankful for the way that You're touching us here at the Manchester Church of God. Father, have Your way. Speak to us this morning. Give us direction, God. 
give us the guidance that we so desperately need. Father, thank you for the blessings of this life, for all that you do for us. Father, this morning we give back to you. We, we offer our tithes, our offering. Father, that you would accept it, that it would be good in your eyes, that you would multiply it, and that you would use it. We praise you for all things. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the church said, Amen. like half or wherever they you know wherever they fell but the good thing for us is our church stayed fairly stable and we survived COVID <laughs> if you remember that and everything has been actually our numbers now are better than what we were before COVID so uh, we're we're just really excited about that but one of our issues is is we have a fellowship hall that is getting too small for us we have a fellowship hall that has some some issues and so but the, there's some good things let me just talk about a couple of good things one is church growth we've had some growth in our church and our building we, a few years ago we paid off our building so everything that we own we're free and clear on everything that we own we have a great children's program our children's program has done great the interesting thing is we've had sometimes we've had people to come and check out our children's program from other churches because they're hearing good things about us. We have a, a really strong youth ministry and our youth ministry this morning. I don't know if you notice or not. We have a few people missing here this morning. They are actually doing youth ministries, actually doing children's church this morning. So let's just give our youth. <clears throat> so Tim is speaking in youth this morning. But he also took the youth band down. He also took the youth band down to the children's church, and they did worship this morning for our children. So we're really excited about that. Uh, but one of the good things that we also have here is we have a just a great group of people, and uh, just a wonderful group of people that love God and love each other, <clears throat> and we are pressing to do this thing. So. Here at Manchester Church of God, we are, we're working, we're working to climb the mountain. A year ago, there was a, a we had a little phrase that came up and it was, give me this mountain, <clears throat> give me this mountain. And so we knew that that was about church growth, but we didn't know, we didn't know really what that, like everything that that entailed. But now we know more about that, that we are in need of a building. So we have this need to expand. So let's go to our next slide. Phase one. <clears throat> so we're in phase one now of trying to figure out what to do with this building. One of our issues is, is when we go to our fellowship hall down here is it's getting too small. When we have events, three years ago when we had our wild game dinner, we had, all, we had about 120 men in our, in our fellowship hall and we we kind of stuffed tables in the corners and stuff, and we put stuff here and there. We had everything kind of put around, and <clears throat> because of just how we were set up, it was difficult to get everybody in there. I mean, we did it, but the interesting thing, we can get about 130, 140 people in our fellowship hall, but the thing of it is, some Sundays, counting children's church, we can have 160 people in the building. So we obviously, if you do the math, you see that we're, we're lacking in some space. Now, there's a couple of things about the building. Some of you know this, some of you may not. The building down there is old. 
And it has some problems. The building is actually the same level as the ground on the outside. When we have heavy rains, water runs in on the floor. There's nothing we can do about that except do grade work around the building. We're looking at five, six, maybe eight, ten thousand dollars to do grade work and to fix that. And so, but if we have a building that's aging and that has some issues, has some structural issues and things like that, I don't know that we want to put a lot of money into our building when we're, when we're uh, at that stage. So the condition of our building is not good. Uh, it's not that it's fallen over. And we still, we're still using it. The good thing is we're going to use this building until we're ready to do something different. I mean, and the good thing is, is we don't have to do anything. We're not, there's no, we're not in any time rush. There's, we're not in any struggle to do anything. And those are some really good things. But what we need to do is we feel like as we continue to grow, what's going to happen is the more we use the building, the more complicated it gets. Uh, see, on Sunday mornings, our children's church is, it has to use fellowship hall because there's not enough room over in the old children's church room. Between jam kids and children's church down here, we can have as many as 50 people in children's church on a Sunday morning. So if you put 50 people, I don't know if you've ever had 50 people in that children's church room, it is absolutely crazy crowded in there, and you just can't, it's, 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 not, a good, um, it's not a good setup for, for really doing ministry. So phase one, here's what we need to do, is we need somewhere around $100,000 to get started um, on, this, on this building project. We need more than that, but our first phase is going to be $100,000. And um, so I, we've talked about how much a building would cost. It's going to be somewhere, the absolute lowest number that we've heard of is about $600,000. There's very few people that are talking about that number. Most of the numbers that we hear is closer to a million dollars because building costs have went up so much. But here's what I know. God is faithful. Amen? Don't you believe that? So let me, let me show you a couple slides. We're going to go through a couple slides. And we're going to look at this. And we're going to talk about some things. So this slide right here is the first plan that we looked at. And this plan um, is a 60 by, by 130 building. It has, some, it has a, a classroom on the bottom. has some storage. has a large kitchen, bathrooms. And then the next slide is the upper level. And the upper level has a room for children's ministry and has a room for youth ministry. So those, those two ministries would have their own space and that would free up the, the floor on the thing. But if you see this yellow box right here, you see this yellow box, that is the existing building that we have right now. It's a 40 by 80. So this building that right here is over double, it's just right over double the space of what of what we have. And so that would probably be the minimum that we would need to have to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So the next slide is this slide right here, and I don't know if you can see this, but I have these on paper if, if anybody wanted to look at them. This building, this is another building that we looked at, and Tim drew this up, and he did a great job. Man, I have been just, just really impressed with all the good thing that how Tim's been helping us with this thing. But this building here is a 75 foot wide, it's 125 foot long, and so it has a, uh, there would be a very similar size um, main space, it would be just a little bigger than a basketball, like a regulation basketball court in the middle. It would have uh, some rooms on the end of the building, a kitchen, some bathrooms, but then down the side of the building, it would be a couple of classrooms and a vestibule down the side. The upper, the, uh, the upstairs is the, um, is the next slide. Is that the upper level? Okay, I can't see it good. And then this is the existing fellowship hall. So that building is about almost three times the size of what? Uh, the building that we have right now. That building is probably going to be a little more expensive than the first one. So here's what I'm saying. One of the things that we have to do is, I mean, it's great. We, we, need, 
you know, we need space. We're growing. There's a lot of good things happening. Our children's ministry is growing. Youth ministry is growing. All those good things are happening. But one of the things that we have to do is we continue to grow. We have to, we have to make space for the ministry that we have. So one of the things is in phase one and give me this mountain, the, the building campaign here is we have to raise some funds. And so we passed out these um, cards today. But let me, let me just mention a few things before we get to the cards. So one of the things that we need to do is as we start raising money for a building, one of the things that we need to do is we need to continue to tithe. So if people put their money in building fund and they don't tithe, then we're not going to have heat and air. And when we just spent 800, uh, 800 almost $1,000 on the roof here, we had a, if anybody who sat in that little seat back there, you were the one who got leaked on a few weeks ago, we had a, a, a seal come off of our ridge vent in a storm, didn't realize it, and it leaked up there, it leaked up here a little bit. And so, you know, it's just $1,000, no big deal, right? But if people aren't paying their tithes, we don't do maintenance. So let me say this. We're, we're, we're wanting to start this building program. We're wanting to start some fundraising for a building program. We can't give up on our regular giving. Tithe is so important. Why do we tithe? Because tithe is scriptural. Tithing is the Old Testament. It's, it's the Old Testament. Jesus acknowledged tithing in the New Testament. Every now and then you hear people want to discredit tithing and stuff, and they want to discredit giving. I had somebody one time say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to uh, my time. I give my time. Uh, we can't find that in Scripture. It sounds good. It was probably good at the dinner table, but it doesn't work in real life. But what we do need to do is we need to, we need to, we need to pay our tithe. Tithe is 10% of your income. It's 10% of what you earn. So we pay our tithe. So pay your tithes. Here's what... Here's what we do. You pay your tithe, but then this would be extra on top of that. And so here's what we want to do. Let's go to this little card here. It's going to be on the screen. You have one in your hand, hopefully. Yes, we want to go to the next slide. I promise you there's another slide. There was this morning. Let's talk just for a minute about this. Oh, you're right. So, I'm trying to read my notes here. So, Today, we're asking people to fill out these pledge cards. Uh, you can use online giving. We have a building um, fund on online giving if you want to use that. Um, and also, we ask people in the next few months, we're going to ask people to, to give um, you know, time and resources. Uh, it, let me say this about the building. We are, there's not going to be any construction or anything in the next. It's going to be, this is a good ways down the road. We're not starting this in three or four months. Uh, we have to have money before we can build another building. And what we're going to do is we're just going to continue to do ministry. We're going to continue to do children's ministry and women's ministry and youth ministry. And we're going to continue to do everything that we're doing. But when we get to the point uh, where we need more room, we will have to, we'll have to do some kind of building. It, let me say this. So we talked with an architect a few weeks ago. And one of the things that the architect said was, that you may even be, you don't want to miss what God is trying to do with your church. And one of the things that you may want to look at is, one is build a building. And they said, you don't want to outbuild your property. And so we don't want to put a, we don't want to have a $4 million property because if you, if you continue to grow, what happens is, is when you eventually have to come off the property. You eventually have to go somewhere else. And you can't get your money out of the property. So we're, gonna, we're just going to pray. As we pray over this thing, we're going to say, God, give us insight on a building or if we need to relocate. Whatever we need to do, God, help us to do that. Give us your direction. Give us your direction, God. We want to we do... 
here's what we're doing. We're doing ministry. There's a lot of great things happening, but we want God's direction on this thing. So here's what we want to do. I want us to take a moment and I want us to pray and say, God, give us your direction. Give us your direction. God, there's, there's decisions that need to be made in the next few months, in the next year. There's decisions that need to be made. And we understand this, that if we miss those decisions, if, we, if you're shooting a gun and you're six inches off, you know what? You wounded the animal, but you didn't kill it. You don't get it. And in life, I think it's more important that when we make decisions, that we, we absolutely hit it. It's absolutely where it needs to be. And so what we know is that God never misses. Amen? Can we take a moment this morning and just pray, Father, I come to you right now. And I pray, God, that you would give us direction. God, I pray right now that you would give us understanding. God, I pray right now, God, that you would, you would pour into us insight and strength, God, and let us see you and know you, God. God, we understand, God, that as our rooms fill up and God, as, as buildings start having issues, we understand, God, that somewhere in this, God, that you're moving us forward and, and we want to hear from you, God. And God, more than that, God, we want to see your favor over what we're doing, God. We want to see your hand, God, over our ministry. And this morning, God, we pray, give us direction, give us your favor, because we need you. We honor you and we worship you, God, for the good things that you do. We pray this in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Could you take just a few minutes? You have these little pledge cards. Could you take just a few minutes and look at this and make some kind of decision? As you look at these pledge cards, it shows weekly, monthly, one year total. It's weekly, we just said, if like for example, this first blank right here, five dollars weekly. It turns out to be if you if you divide that by fifty-two weeks, it's going to be twenty-two dollars a month, and then that's going to be what is that? Two hundred, two hundred sixty a year. I don't have my glasses on. So, if you want to do that, in the next few minutes, our ushers are going to come, and we're going to take up our offering this morning. If you want to turn these in the next few weeks, if you want to take this home and pray about it, that's fine. Ever how you want to do it, I just know this. If God gives us a direction, He can meet the need. A few years ago, we owed over $100,000 on this building. The interesting thing is we have, we do not have a big money person in the church. Some churches you'll have some millionaire guy who's showing up every now and then. We don't have that. But I know this, that when we started paying off this building, you know what happened? People were just putting in $25 a week, $10 a week, $15 a week. And we did that. And you know what happened to that $100,000 that we owed? In about a year and a half, you know what happened to it? It was gone. It was gone. And you know how it happened? It was where everybody joined together and the blessing of God came on that money. And what happened was God removed our debt. I'm telling you, when we started that, when we started that, in my little brain, I said, I don't see how it's going to happen. Because I know there's nobody in the building who has a million dollars. I don't know how it's going. I don't understand how it's going to happen. But the Holy Spirit said, trust me. And about a year and a half later, guess what? It was gone. It was gone. And you know how it happened? It happened with the church people just giving money. Because let me remind you of this. The interesting thing is, we have never gotten money from anywhere but the people who sat in these seats. We have never, we've, we've never got, the state of Tennessee has never given us a penny. The United States federal government has never given us a penny. The Church of God state office, the international office, I don't want to say that they haven't given us a penny, but they don't, we, I don't know if you know this, we actually support them. We're propping them up. They're not giving money to us, we're giving money to them. The only, 
we, we have three buildings and over six, seven acres of land here. And every bit of it is debt free because the people that attended this church are the ones who paid for it. Nobody else. Amen. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I think that's great. Amen. Our ushers are going to come at this time, if you will. You can turn in your pledge cards today. You can do that later. But help us, help us climb that mountain and take that mountain. Amen. Praise God.
the rock on which I stand when everything around me shaken I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down he's faithful through generations
Will we just raise our hands this morning and acknowledge Him? God, I thank You when the rain comes and when the wind blows, God, that You are the one that holds my house together. God, because I built on the rock, I built on Your foundation, God. It is You, oh God, who holds my house together. And this morning, I acknowledge that. This morning, I give You praise. This morning, we've come to worship You. This morning, we've come to magnify the mighty name of God because of the great things that You do. God, You are my help. God, in the time of trouble, You're my help. God, in the day of peace, You're my soul. God, I worship You this morning. I worship Your name. I praise Your name, oh God. And I believe in what You're doing. Oh, I believe in what You're doing. Let's sing that, Josh. Let's sing that. The wind blew. One more time. that for a moment church can we just stand in his presence for a moment and just lift up the mighty name of Jesus can we give worship and give praise to his name this morning oh I believe oh God in what you're doing God I thank you for the day when you delivered me out of the muck and the mire I thank you God for the day God when you rescued me God and I thank you for every day that you've been faithful to me God, I thank you for every day that you've placed my feet upon a firm foundation. And you've given me a place to stand. Oh God, you've sheltered me when the storms of life come. God, you've sheltered me. This day, God, we give you praise. We give you praise, oh God. Oh God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God, we worship your name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning. Last week we talked about the anointing. I want to speak to you this morning about the anointing again. We're going to continue this. We're going to talk King Saul and David this morning. We're going to talk King Saul and David. These are two great examples of the anointing. You have David and Saul. Very similar stories. They were both just a little bit of nothing. They come from kind of insignificant families. They come from just uh, nothing amazing about their lives. They don't have some crazy talent. And they don't have some you know, financial backing or any of these things. They are just normal people. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. That they are just normal people. They are just good, normal people. Who somewhere in their life, they said, God, I am ready to serve you. God, I am good to serve you. So I want you to, right now, I want you to just turn to the devil and say, all of that talk about that I'm not talented enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not in position. I don't have influence. I don't have this. I don't have that. That means nothing in God's economy. Because when God steps into the scene, He can take a little shepherd boy and raise him up and be one of the greatest kings that the world has ever known. And it was not because David was good with a sling, but it was because David allowed and wanted the anointing of God to, to work in his life 
And David did some amazing things because God's anointing was upon him. I want to tell somebody here this morning that God's anointing can rest on you. You do not have to be some crazy talented person with some, some great pedigree. I, I, I always find it interesting. We, we've done a lot of horse stuff and, and I've had people say, Oh man, you can go back and look at this horse's you know, all their papers and go back and look. Their, their great-grandfather was this kind of champion and this. But if the horse doesn't ride good, I don't really care what his grandfather did because his grandfather's been gone for 50 years. I'm more concerned about what the horse can do right now. I'm concerned about how does he ride right now. I'm concerned about is he going to be a good horse or not. And I'm here to tell somebody that God can step in your life and take you from zero to hero. And I believe that I've seen that so many times. Let's read this passage this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. And it says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, on Saul's head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. I just want to say that to somebody this morning. God wants to anoint you over some portion of his inheritance. God wants to anoint you and he wants you to do something over a portion of his inheritance. And don't let, so sometimes people will say, well, you know, these, this group over here, they stopped me. This group over here, they... They, they stopped me from doing this. This group of, this person over here, they have some kind of position and, and they're not allowing me to really do. Nope, nope, none of that means anything. When God says, you're mine, I'm telling you, there's not a person on this little bitty earth that will stop what God wants to do. They get, people cannot stop God. So just receive His call, walk in His anointing, and do the things that He's called you to do. Because the enemy loves to give us these excuses why we can't do what God's calling us to do. He loves for us to say, oh, look around you. Look at all this stuff going on. Look at all this stuff. So let me back up and just talk just for a minute about last week. What is the anointing? We hear this word, Pentecostal churches, you hear this word, the anointing. I felt the anointing. I saw the anointing. The anointing was strong. The anointing strong on him, the anointing strong on her. We hear those. Most of the time, these are good statements. They're correct. Um, if you feel the anointing, I'm sure you feel it. I had somebody that a few years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, came to this church here, and they came to me and they told me in private, they said, I am not a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I. I'm living a sinful life. They, they told me some things that they were doing, and I was like, you are correct. We'll check that box. You're living a sinful life. But they said, there is something about when I come in here and during the praise and worship and, and during the service, there is, there is this feeling that I get that I don't feel anywhere else, and it is something about God that I'm feeling God. And I told them, I said, it is His presence that you feel. It's the presence of God. And I'm telling you that you can feel His presence whether you know Him or not. And so the anointing, this is where the Holy Spirit covers you. It's where it covers you. So in this passage right here, 1 Samuel 10, Samuel takes a flask of oil and he pours it over Saul's head. Now here's the interesting thing. I don't think the oil had anything special about it. The oil represents in the physical what's happening in the spiritual the oil represents the presence of god it represents the holy spirit the holy spirit because saul has received this this assignment as king now god has said saul i'm going to go with you and i'm going to walk with you and i'm going to open doors for you and i'm going to help you in all different ways and so the the oil represents that the holy spirit is covering saul and it represents that the Holy Spirit is upon Saul. And so the anointing was poured 
upon Saul, but this is a physical example of what's taking place in the spiritual. The Greek and the Hebrew, when you talk about these words in the Greek and the Hebrew, it basically just means smearing or covering. When you say that word anointing, it just means that you're smearing oil. You're just covering, you're pouring oil on something. So the next time you cook that chicken, you're putting some oil on it, and they come in there and they say, what are you doing? You say, I'm anointing the chicken. Right? Well, it's not the same thing, but it is, the, it is kind of the correct word. But we read here, when, we, when you read through this story of 1 Samuel, starting back a few chapters prior to verse 10, you see that Saul has this calling upon his life. And he, he answers this call. The interesting thing is Saul in the very beginning is, is a very humble man. He's a very humble man and he's, he's, very, he's, very, he's very ready to receive what God has for him. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 21 says this, And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite? Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least? Of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Let me help you with this because there's a few verses, there's several verses that kind of go with this. What Saul is saying is, is, I'm not for sure why you're doing this because I don't think that I'm really the person for the job. And, and I understand what you're doing is you're... you're telling me that God has appointed me and anointed me as king and God has pulled me out and he's doing this, but I'm here to make sure that you're not making a mistake because I am the least qualified for this job. Saul really kind of downgrades himself, but the truth of it is, is what he says here, it is the truth. He did not have this super rich family heritage that had kings and priests and all kinds of people in his family. But he was just common Joe, but let me remind you who God is. He does not need a pedigree to put you in position to do what God wants to do in your life. God does not need your grandfather to be somebody amazing. I hope your grandfather is amazing, but God doesn't need that to put you where he wants you. God is the one who calls you. And God is the one who will place you. And Saul starts out this kingship in a very humble, in a very honest way. And this is one of the reasons that God calls Saul and anoints him to be king. Let me remind you that this is what God is wanting to do in your life. This is what God is wanting to do in our life. This story here is not just a story about King Saul but this story can be a story about us. In that when I say, God, I want to fulfill what you want to do in my life. I, I want to be there, God. I want to do what you want me to do, God. I, I want to be that person, God. Help me to do that. But God, I understand this, that I don't know that I have the right talents and the abilities and the skills and, and all the connections that need to take place for me to do this. When we come to God with that, humble, ready spirit. This is what happens. God says, I can get you to where you need to be. I can get you to where you need. I can do what needs to be done in your life. See, this is, this is our life. This is our story. Here's what happened in Saul's life. Saul allowed pride to get in his life. So he allows pride to get in his life. And what happened is, so pride lives with him for a little while. And then what happens is, is after a few months, after a few years, pride starts to build some rebellion. And that rebellion leads to disobedience. And King Saul loses his anointing. King Saul, listen to me, hear this. Because somewhere in this, sometimes we feel like that once we get started, because Grandma said this was great or whatever, somewhere in this thing we feel like that we're good. God can say at any moment, 
you're not where you need to be, I'm going to take my hand off of you. And this story, the tragedy of this story is, is that Saul felt like because of his experience and because of his connections and because people who are talking to him, be careful, little ears, what you hear, right? Be careful who's speaking into you, right? Several years ago, I had a good friend of mine who was doing some, just some, some ministry in their church and stuff. It was real interesting. They, he started listening to a man. He started listening to a man who was doing some kind of prophetic ministry. And the interesting thing is over a course of time, this man started telling my friend, God's really impressing on me that you need to be giving me money for my ministry. And so the interesting thing, what happened was, is over the course of several, probably four or five years, they're just constantly this, you got to, the, the prophecies began to more and more about just give me money. And he, for a few years, really poured in a lot of money into this man's ministry. And that thing that happened was, is he really got nothing out of that ministry. But he propped this guy up for a few years. So you need to be careful who's speaking into your ears because it is in this story as you read through 1 Samuel that you see that Saul had people who were talking to him and directing him and leading him and those people led him into a place of pride and a place of rebellion and a place of disobedience. And God removes his anointing. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 17 says this. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? What he's saying is, is in the beginning, when you said, the previous verse that we read where Saul said, Man, I'm the smallest of the tribes. My family's the smallest of the families. And so Samuel goes back and refers to that. It's almost like he pulls out the statement and says, let me show you, Saul, what you wrote. Let me show you the, the agreement that you signed. And so he says, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? When you said, I'm so small, but at that time when you said those words, you were still king over Israel. And God's anointing was on you. And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Isn't that what God did? God anointed you king over Israel? You said I'm unqualified. You said I can't do it. But what did God do? God anointed you king over Israel. Verse 18 says this. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. This is what God told them to do. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? The interesting thing is it was God who sent Samuel to confront Saul. This wasn't Samuel. Samuel didn't look, he didn't read through the manual, the rule book, and say, I was reading through the statements of faith of the church of God, and I, I see here, King Saul, that you've missed on a couple of things, and I'm going to call you on this. No, what happened was God Himself spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, you've got to go take the anointing off this man. You've got to go pull the anointing off of him. Now here's an interesting thing. This story proves That you can lose the anointing, but keep your position. Man. Because it, God left Saul in that position. He left him there. and he, he let him be king for several more years. For several years, it's Saul who chases after David. The interesting thing about Saul and, and David's relationship is the Philistines... And the Amalekites and all these people are all surrounding Israel and they're continuing to come in and punish the, the Israeli people. But what Saul is doing is through the last few years of his life is he is more interested in getting David 
than defending Israel. And it's got to do with the anointing has been pulled off of his life. And now Saul's doing it on his own. And when we do church on our own, it's a mess. When we make decisions, you know, just like this whole building thing, here's my whole thought on this thing. If God doesn't give us peace, we can't go forward. We have to have God's peace. We can't get just a sale price. I talked with one of our council guys a few weeks ago, and I said, hey, somebody told me that there was metal buildings that were going on sale. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to go figure that out. And I went and I checked it out. And you know what I found out? Metal buildings are always on sale. Anybody remember J.C. Penney's? I think they're still in business, aren't they? Belk? <laughs> Any of those? Sir? You go in there, and what is it? Well, what weekend is it? It's Labor Day. Labor Day weekend. It's Labor Day weekend sale. Oh, it's Father's Day. It's what? It's Father's Day sale, right? Mother's Day sale. What weekend is it? That's what sale it is. And sometimes if they don't have anything, they just do no sale sale. <laughs> Best friend sale. They're doing all this stuff. But the interesting thing is, when you went into JCPenney's, it wasn't that the stuff wasn't on sale. It was, what was it, 20%, 30%, or 40%? What, which, which weekend was it? And so I called on this building, and they were like, yeah, we, uh, sure, we have a building on sale, and we have one that was ordered, but somebody didn't pick it up, and we'll sell it to you at this price. So I, was, I, wrote, that, I wrote the price down. I called another building place, and I said, hey, I'm looking for this size of building. What would this building... You know what's the interesting thing? The second place that I called, they gave me a better price on the building than the guy who had one already on sale. I wanted to call the guy, the first guy back and say, hey, guess what? Your sale price is worse than the guy's regular price. So here's what I understand about that. I need God's direction. Because there is so much out there that can trick you and trip you and get you going in the wrong direction. Every day I want to wake up and say, God, I do not know how to do this. I need you to guide me. God, I don't understand everything. I need you to direct me. God, I need you. I need your hand upon my life. Saul proves that you can keep your position and your gifts. Let me just say that again. Saul proves that you can keep your position and your gifts and lose the anointing. There was a moment in Saul's life after Samuel came and told him that he was done. There was a time where Saul steps in with some prophets and he prophesies. It's a little interesting little story. But the interesting thing is sometimes you can keep the gifts for a season. But the anointing is gone. Somebody might think that losing the anointing, that it would be... Further punishment to lose your position, right? You lost the anointing, and then God takes away your position. How about this? I had a friend of mine say this a while back, and it just stuck in me. He said, wouldn't it be worse if God takes the anointing, but leaves you in the position? Because now you're doing the position without the hand of God. Oh, what a thought. I said... Man, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and he talked about how that when God takes your anointing, but leaves you in the position, then all of a sudden, you find yourself making bad decisions like chasing David all over the country instead of fighting the Philistines. Don't we see in Saul's life how silly he becomes the last 15 years of his life? last 20 years of his life, he becomes very silly about what he's doing, he loses the whole focus about what God had called him to do. God had called him to be king of Israel, not David's babysitter. But what happened was, the last 20 years of his life, he felt like it was his job to undo David. Because one time when David and the army came in, what did they say? Saul has slayed his thousands. 
But David has slain his ten thousands. And the Bible said that he was so jealous and he was so furious with that statement. From then on, he pursued David and tried to kill him. Why did he do that? Because he lost the anointing. He lost the anointing. He lost God's covering over his life. He lost the direction of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I've come to tell somebody this morning. Without the anointing, without God directing your life, it feels like we know how to drive. It feels like we know how to get the bus there. But what happens is we make wrong turns. We make wrong turns. And then what happens, I'm, I would think that everybody in this room can think back to a day most of you, except for probably my 20-year-olds back there, you probably hadn't got to this point to where you've made mistakes. I can think back to a day when I did stuff, and later in life I looked back and I said, that was the dumbest thing that I could ever have done in my life. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And so what happens is, without the Holy Spirit directing our life, See, let me just say this. The enemy loves to start out small. He loves to start. He does not start out and say, what you need to do is you need to go out and buy that million dollar house. And then just, just within months, you just financially crash. He's probably not going to do that. But what he likes to do is start out and just get some small things out of order and get small things out of place. And this is out of place. That's out of place. And it's just little things. It's just small things here and there. And he gets this stuff out of place. And he works his way up to where then bigger things get out of place. Here's a real interesting thought. Saul, the Bible said, had an evil spirit. After the anointing left him, the Bible said that he had an evil spirit. But the interesting thing is when David would enter the room, what happened? That evil spirit would be moved out because David had the presence of God in his life. Because the Holy Spirit of God was walking with David. And as the Holy Spirit, remember this, when the devil is confronted by God, he always has to move out of the room. And so every time David would walk in the room, Saul would be a little upset with David, but he would love the presence of God. And David would pull out a harp and start playing on that harp, and the, the, the evil spirit would be pushed out of the room, and there we would see that the presence of God would feel peace and put strength back into the room. So somebody in here needs to hear this. God wants to direct you. God wants to be your director. He wants to cover you with His presence. But here's what we have to do. Is we have to say, God, let me. Let me walk in your ways. Now, is anybody in here going to be king of Israel? There might. There might be one in here. We don't want to shut the door on that. But the truth of it is, probably not. Are we going to be the President of the United States? I'm hoping for it. Probably not. Maybe. But I think that every person in here, God has something amazingly important to do in your life. And that it will change if you will allow God to direct your steps. It will change eternity. It will change eternity. God will use you to move mountains. God will use you to calm the seas. God will use you to open doors. God will use you to just change things that no man can change. That if you had not allowed the Holy Spirit to direct your life, it would have never happened. Josh, would you come this morning? I know this. We need the anointing. We need the touch of God. We need God's direction on our life. We need God's direction on our church. We just talked this morning. The architect came a few weeks ago. We had an architect, and we're not bound with any of these people. I've talked with a, 
an engineer, an architect. I've talked with builders. I've talked with all kinds of people. We're not bound to any of these people. But this is what the architect told us a few weeks ago. Well, this thing could run to a million two, a million three. And you know what I did? I passed out. Randall came and picked me up out of the floor and Winston helped me and they set me back up in my seat. I was like, I, I don't want to hear that. So we're at a crossroad. Every Sunday morning, Children's Church is down there, but you know what? Three hours later, youth show up and they have to rearrange the room down there to do youth service. And then Wednesday night, you show back up and use that on Wednesday night. But then when we have a dinner or something, guess what happens? We have to figure out how to do children's church. And it's a big mess down there. And so I have people coming to me and saying, hey, how do we do this? How do we do that? And I'm saying, I don't know. But I know this. God will never lead you to a place like this and say, you figure it out. No, you know what he says? I have a plan. Walk with me. And so here's what I'm saying. God, I need your plan. I need your plan. I need your plan. I, I don't know how to do this thing. I think there's probably parents out there that you understand this. Any parents out there with teenagers? Any parents out there, you know? And, and here's the thing this. Teenagers are, it's a wonderful time of life. I love going to soccer games. I love doing basketball. I love doing all this stuff. I love all this. But there are times where there's this breakdown in communication. And there's a struggle with that. But I know this, God, God brought me into this earth that I would raise these children. This is what he, this is my assignment. One of my, one of my biggest assignments that I'll ever do is raise these children. And it's a, it's a wonderful assignment. It's a blessed assignment. I, I, I am so blessed every time I think about what God has, has given me to do. And I say, thank you, God. But here's one of the things that I understand. Because I look back on this raising children. I know that I haven't done everything right. And I say, God, I need you to help me. So if you have a family, I'm telling you right now, step before God and say, God, I need you to direct my family. Because I understand that the enemy every day is coming to that, coming to every member of that family saying, turn away, do this, go there, go this. God, I need you. I need your anointing. I need your direction. God, I need your covering. Pour your oil over me. Maybe, maybe somebody in here has a job. Maybe somebody's in here and you're in school. Maybe somebody has some kind of something that you're doing in life. Let me just say this. You need God's direction in your life. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, you need God's direction to walk through life. But more than that, the things that God wants you to do is you need His covering to do those things. Let me just say this. There is something amazing when you look back and you see the hand of God on your life. Oh, you look back and you say, God, oh, I thank you, God, for what you're doing. I thank you, God. I, I remember, God, when you provided this need. God, I remember over here God, when we were lost and, and you, you showed us the way out. God, I remember this day, God, when, when I could not complete the task. My energy was gone. My desire, my drive was gone. And, and there was a day when the drive and the energy was there. But there was a moment in time when it, it left me. God, you stepped in and you brought people in and they encircled me. And they picked up the task and they walked rest of the way with me. God, I thank you. Two things I want us to do as we end this service. One, we want to say, God, cover me. And then we want to say, God, I thank you. I want to thank you, God, for where you've brought me, what you brought me from and where you've got me. Can we do that? Would you stand with us this morning?
Would you stand with us? And could we do that? Could we just go to the Lord in prayer right now and just ask for His covering? Father, I come to you this morning. God, I ask for your anointing. God, I ask for your anointing over mothers and over fathers, just over people. God, whether whoever they are and wherever they're at in life, God, right now, I'm asking for your anointing for my life, God. I'm asking for your anointing as a father who has children, who who I'm responsible to raise and I'm responsible to get them to adult. God, right now, I pray as a father. I pray as a husband. God, help me, God, to do marriage the way you want me to do it. Because, God, I know that sometimes I don't do it the way that you called me. God, I'm asking you for my job as pastor of this church. I need your anointing, God. I I don't always know how to do this stuff, God. I don't always understand everything. And I make decisions that don't work. But I understand this, God, that when you're in it, it never fails. It never fails. So right now, I pray, God, cover me. Oh, would you do that right now? Would you just ask for his cover? Father, God, cover me. Anoint me. Let your Holy Spirit run down my beard. Let it run down my robe. Oh, let your Holy Spirit, God, be upon me, I pray. And second, I say thank you, God, for where you've brought me from. I thank you, God, that in the days of of trial and struggle, God, you raised me up. God, I worship your name. I worship your name. If you need prayer this morning beyond what we've already prayed, there's just something in your life. There's something that has just chased you. There's something that's wrestled with you. Or maybe you just maybe you just want to just come and just lift up the name of Jesus. I don't know. Whatever it is, if you need prayer as we sing this song, would you come? We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you. Would you come? Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad, I put my faith in Jesus, He never Faithful through generation, so why would he fail now? He won't. No more. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be.
right quick. I'm going to make it through. Amen. Amen. Let's do that. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your protection. We thank you, God, that you're with us. Oh, we worship your name. We worship your name. God, we lift you up and praise you. We thank you, God. We need you, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Kim Bagley, pray over us as we go. <laughs> 